I'm Jim Ladd. Tonight, our special guest, John Lennon. Oh, I'm a fan, Beatle fan, you know. Yeah, I know them all. I met them all once. A few weeks ago, we went to New York, then to the fourth floor of an office building where John Lennon is helping me tape the microphone to a coffee cup. I forgot the mic stand. And then he sets the coffee cup and the microphone on a couple of books. And I begin to wonder if this is a typical day in the life of John Lennon. Well, there's two kinds of days. There's the days when I'm working in the studio. This is in, in general, not counting quick trips around to different places, but in general I'm either in, in a studio recording or remixing or whatever to do with the studio. And if I'm not doing that, generally, anyway, I like today I wake up around 11, 11.30. Inject myself with caffeine, about a gallon of it, and pick up and come to the studio. On a day that I'm not in the studio, I would get up or wake up about the same time. Uh, I always get the papers, switch the TV on anyway, whatever I'm doing, even if I'm not listening to it. And if I'm not in the studio, I might just hang out, take a walk out to the office or something, see what the letters are, you know, what's cooking there or just stay in. My favorite occupation is staying in. I have to go out to appreciate staying in a lot because I tend to be a homebody. What is it like to be John Lennon? Knowing that at 34, you've already played an instrumental and highly vocal role in changing the world. A guy who has played before the Queen of England and is prone to wearing sanitary napkins on his head. With someone idealistic enough to call for peace before it was fashionable. Surrealistic enough to point the way to Pepperland, and realistic enough to know where he's at today. Well, I'm as happy as I've ever been, you know? I mean, I don't think any of us are happy, and it's, you know, but I don't think we're all miserable. And I think I, it's an old cliche that I've been saying for years, but it's heaven and hell every day. And I just swing with it as it goes along. At the moment, I'm fairly happy. I'm pleased with the album. The album's doing well, so that helps make the heaven of the day a little better, you know? But uh, I think happiness comes whether you're doing well or not doing well. It doesn't seem to have anything to do with how you're doing half the time. I don't never think of myself as a professional, then a non-professional. Uh, the work is just part of my life. That's why, say I'm not in the studio, I might be on the piano or I'm just thinking music all the time. So it's not like a separate thing which I, I approach. It's just, that's how I am, you know? That's, it just happens to be the job I do. Some of the early stuff, it's fine by me, you know, some of it wasn't, but it wasn't then. There's not, there's very few of them that the Beatles recorded in the early days that I thought were good then and don't think they're good now. And uh, the other question about how near have I got to whatever I'm trying to get, it's usually a moment on a track, you know, I mean, I'm always looking for whatever it is and I'm sure I'll never find it, that's why we all go on and on, etc., etc. But there'll be a couple of bars on the track where it's just what I want to hear, but I can never sustain it for three minutes or four minutes, not exactly what I want. And uh, there's very few records that I ever hear that can that really hold me for the whole record. You know, it's just however much buzz you can get out of whatever record for how long. John, during the Beatles' electronic number period, nine. <laughs> you guys kept a lot of people awake nights, playing their albums at slower speeds and recording them on tape to play backwards and all kinds of things. Were there messages hidden in there? Or no, it was pure artistic expression, you know, and if you, you were talking in terms of painting, you know, the, 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 they had their blue period, their green period, and their brown period, you know. And uh, it was just purely music to us. As we discovered more about music through one form or another, we transmitted it to the record, and then it went out to the public, you know. And we had a few little games like putting, you know, hee hee hee, or, you know, slightly double entendre expression in the background and see if anybody got it and we knew people were listening hard you know and it's like a personal message even if it's something dumb like you know a monty python kind of joke i still get off on that i put all sorts of little pieces in records but they're not meant to be cosmic philosophies they're just you know little you know jokes like a 
It's like having a late night talk show and you only put it out twice a year. Everyone in the field is as time went by, they get a little bit older and a little bit slower. Those are the things I like to listen now. Like there's something on Walrus, which isn't a really in joke, it's just I never printed it. There's a big choir singing, everybody's got one, everybody's got one at the end. So I forget how to hear those little mumbling things that came through the radio. And I get off on the, those little things that one tends to forget about in records. The little jokes and things like that. That's what turns me on when I hear them now. That's not what it said. It said everybody's one's part. No, it said everybody's got one. No, it didn't. Yes, it did. I mean, I, yeah, I feel like I'm talking to A.J. Webb. And, you know, he tells you, no, it means this. I said, no, it doesn't. I wrote it. Let's talk about stealing glass. Oh, yeah, well, that's that's one of the fun fun tracks for me with all that who is it, who is it, I'm whispering at the beginning. Because it actually isn't about one person in particular, although it has been about a few people. And like a novel writer, if I'm writing about something other than myself, I, I use other, other people that I know or have known as examples if I want to write a, a down song, I'd have to remember being down if I'm not physically down that time. Or if I'm writing a thing like Steel and Glass, I use various people as as objects. You know, the song, if I'd listed who they were, it's a, it's a few people and you'd be surprised. You know? But it's really not about anybody now. I'm almost loath to say this. I've said it a few times. It's not about anybody. It spoils the fun. I'd soon everybody think, who's it about? You know, and try and piece it together. For sure, it ain't about Paul, you know, and it ain't about Eartha Kitt. It has a few licks in it, like the saxes are playing the guitar lick from How Do You Sleep, and, and various, I like to, um, you know, compute different variations on my own music, in the music I do, you know, like uh, Steal From Myself, and maybe that, a few people might have thought it was, had to do with Paul again, but it certainly doesn't. John, what do you see as your primary role, musician or philosopher? Oh, musician, you know, I, I wouldn't claim to be a philosopher, only in as much as that I'm interested in philosophy, whatever that is. I would never study it and I don't have that kind of mind to study things. But I pick at all the philosophies that are around, whether it comes out of a, a Stones record or out of some old Indian proverb book. You know, if it says it, it says it, and that's philosophy. And uh, I mainly consider myself a musician, Brackets, artist brackets, which I think is it's all the same kind of game. And artists are a kind of mirror of society and they're not some luxury for society. Although that's the way most um, musicians, quotes, artists, actors, etc. are treated as a kind of peripheral icing on the cake of life. But I don't believe that. And I think it's important what we do and we have to keep telling ourselves that. Because artists... The artistic life is the life where uh, the, the artist gets up in the morning and he doesn't go to the office. So but therefore he has time to look at life while the other people, a lot of other people, have to get on with, the, with a certain kind of physical reality about life and they have no time to think or look at what's going on because they're busy doing it which is cool, you know, and if they can do it, that's fine. Whereas the artist is almost sits back from society and looks at it and draws a picture of it and says, hey, this is what I saw today, you know. And uh, when the non-artist has time to look at it, sometimes they don't like what they see. So I don't look like that, you know. It's when people first hear their voice on the tape recorder or first see the photographs of themselves. They say, do I look like that? Do I sound like that? And an artist is like a tape recorder or a camera and says, yes, this is you, you know, deal with it. It's amazing, but the, still my biggest kick is making the music. You know? And I, I, I almost surprise myself sometimes because there was a period when I was thinking, oh, you know, maybe I'm getting bored with music and is this, is this all I'm going to be doing for the rest of my life? And uh, going through all that kind of dialogue with myself and almost hating the music. And then it almost had nothing to do with the music, you know. It was probably lots of things and we all go through those periods but for the last six months say my biggest buzz is still writing those songs and trying to make them as to say exactly what i want to say or express whatever it is and and recording them and i still get my rocks off like that and then sometimes i look at myself and say well look i was 34 yesterday 
you're not supposed to do this. But then, you know, one voice says, and the other voice says, oh, don't be dumb, you know? You see great artists like B.B. King or, you know, some of the old blues guys, Ray Charles and some of the blues guys, you know, and I see them performing and really getting their rock up and still, I think, no harm, there it is. That's what, that's what you wanted to do and you'll probably be doing it all your life. I hear it over the radio. John Lennon has been departed 30 days. interested to know what is it about America that makes you want to stay here so bad? I think, uh, you know, if there's any hope in the world, uh, America's it. However, you know, however much bad side it has, like, it, it's only like human beings, you know, we're not, we're not saints. And if there's anything cooking or any hope in the world, America has it, and uh, it has the energy, and and everything else, and that's why I want to be here. I feel comfortable here. Luckily, I speak the same language almost. So I really feel at home here. I never really felt a stranger. Even one, you know, the music is international. It's a, that's another cliche, but it's true. And American music was what I was brought up on. I feel quite, it feels quite natural for me to be here. And it's the only unnatural happening is them keep telling me to leave. You know, there's a lot of folks in this country who I think would do something to help you right now if they only knew what to do. Well, look, how much can the public do? It's, very, it's confusing for them to follow what's going on as it is. Because, like a, a cab driver will say, Hey, John, you still here? I thought they threw you out. You know, or, good luck with the fight. You know, they, they know something's going on. And they're probably more aware of it in New York because that's where it's all been going on. So if, you, if that kind of public, they support me, but the taxi cab driver is not, not going to write a letter to his congressman or something. But uh, sort of spiritually, they support me because mo most comments to me are about that on the street, you know, from all age groups. And a lot of people have written to me or sent petitions to different places, and I appreciate it, and I thank them for it. And uh, they usually ask me, what can we do? I think the best thing to do is write your congressman. What's your vision of the future at this point? For, for all of us, it's hard to see the future. I'm not a very good futurologist, you know. I believe that we get whatever we project. Somehow, I couldn't, you know, it's putting it very simply, but somehow I believe that. Example, somebody like Leonardo da Vinci projected that we would fly in machines or go under the water, and we did that. And I think a lot of the human race projected flying. So that's why I always felt that projecting love and peace, even though we're all human and I get violent and not always peaceful, that's what I want. So I think if I project that, then we're going to get it. And when I get depressed about any hope for the future, whatever that means, and maybe it's never going to be different, it's always going to be like this, and, you know, that's what it is. You know, maybe we've got to settle for that, but if there's any change to be made, I think it has as much to do with attitude and projection of thoughts as it has with actually physically changing things. And when I get, if you get down to the nitty-gritty, it's another cliche, it's almost the old battle between good and evil, for want of better words. Because I know oh, there's no such thing as good, there's no such thing as evil. I don't, I don't want to go into all that philosophical games. But the fact is, it seems to be one against the other. And the game seems to be that it's going on anyway, but if you do not do anything about it in a however slight a way, then one side or other gets a slight advantage. So even though it seems like one does something in vain, like want peace or say they want peace or whatever. And people say, well, you didn't get peace, John. You sang about peace, you never got it. So, yeah, not only my fault, but uh, it wasn't good enough, you know? But I think what would have happened if we hadn't said that? All of us together, you know? not me. I'm just the guy that's singing the song to represent what's being said on the, on the street. What would have happened had none of us done that in the 60s? How would it be now? You know, so I believe in the positive side of it. What happened to the, in quotes, revolution? Not the physical revolution, but the whole yeah, game that was going on. I think too. Okay. 
I think, in one way, all of us were under a slight illusion that we might... Maybe it wasn't an illusion. Maybe had we pushed harder, we would have got what we wanted. But I don't sure we, anybody really knew what we wanted. We knew we didn't like what was happening, but nobody quite knew what what it was that we wanted because we'd never had it. We all want to change the world. So there was that sort of backlash on the 60s thing about, oh, you know, that's dumb, you know, that's dumb. Well, it's a, that was a bit juvenile on all our parts in a way because to expect that just because we suddenly decided or discovered something that we wanted that we couldn't get it just by one small effort you know for about five years or something or ten at best i don't doubt if it was even round one it's probably been going on eternally and uh, i think a majority of us whoever we are that's all of us were changed by whatever was going on in the 60s and no doubt before that but that was the period that we were all sort of on to and i think a lot of changes did happen however subtly and they happened and you can never this is something yoko was that you can never unknow what you know and we all know something whatever it was that we found out or discovered for ourselves maybe every generation finds it and loses it and it's up to them to decide what to do once they find out certain realities about life i think you know as that generation goes into middle age or whatever it is that's the decision that they make whether to carry with them that slight torch of light that we all saw and i'm saying maybe every generation sees it and then decides what to do with it you know whether we keep it the light lit would you or just stay, forget it, and let the next ge generation handle this, Will because I've had enough now, I want my, my car and my Will wife, I've decided to before. settle down instead. John, let's talk about drugs. Da -da -da -da. You know, it seems like everybody's in something nowadays. I like leather frogs in the 60s. The drug scene was involved in getting high, a positive energy trip. But today it seems that more and more people are trying to get down. I think uh, it's understandable because I've taken drugs to get down too. When life itself is too energetic or violent or too much to cope with. And that includes drink or overeating, you know. It's the same syndrome, just one form of slowing yourself down and therefore not having to see what's going on. And that is different from the period where people took different drugs to get high. And I, I remember having that quote, unquote, revelation about, oh, everybody's not just simply because they're taking downers, but even with pot, you know, it, when you first take it, I guess it is high and it's a different trip because it's a different trip. But if you really look at it closely, it does almost bring you down, you know. It's more like a sleeping pill than, a, than an upper. In general, the next movement will be people coming off the down trip. But that's going to be pretty painful too, because they'll be withdrawing. I don't mean literally, but the, there'll be a withdrawal from the downers. And then, as it, we, it always gets back to this cycle business, it'll probably go the other way, whether it's to do with drugs or whatever, the, the means of manifesting the expression of how everybody feels at the time they're doing it. Does that make sense? I don't know, yeah, something like that. But I expressed myself on different drugs in different music. Cold Turkey was about the big one. And I couldn't express it better than that. So I always thought, if they're really interested in you know, doing, you know, using me as a, a voice about drugs. I've said it. I said it all there. I can't say it any better. It said, "Ow, it hurts." That's enough. That one minute he was with Maharishi, next minute he's doing this, next minute he's doing that. Well, to me, it's like Pilgrim's Progress, some old book from years ago. You know, you're just going along the path of life, etc., etc., and you take a few turns and you look at the scenery and you check it out. I mean. And, uh, and if it's interesting to me, I go have a look at it. And uh, both meditation and primal therapy helped me in the period that they were there. And I still utilize both things, even now. Although I don't sit around every morning meditating. 
but uh, now and then I'll do it just just to relax myself. And uh, I'll also use the techniques or whatever it's called that I learned in primal therapy to get down to my feelings. If I'm getting choked up and built up and built up and I can't express it other than, say, getting drunk, which I've done, and getting into trouble. If I have a moment, I can get down there and, have, and cry instead. It's that simple. You know, I'm bringing out you know, my eyes instead of, you know, through alcohol or something. And I do use the techniques whenever, whenever I can manage to. But I don't, you know, I, it's every man to his own trip, you know. If I can find better ways of, you know, coping with life, I'll, I'll look for them always. Over the last few years, Many thousands of people have been turning inward or searching to different places or doing whatever it takes to try to get themselves together. Do you think it's ever going to get together collectively? I, I don't know. It's so hard, you know, because you, you tend, one, one tends to sound so naive, projecting anything but death and destruction, you know. I mean, and it's just uh, that it's not in at the moment to project. The, the idea of peace or nirvana or whatever it is we're all looking for and it's in to project decadence and destruction but there seems to be only two choices and I prefer the peaceful one and I don't know you see it's so intangible <laughs> what is it what, what is it we're talking about we're we talking about some kind of social order where everybody's happy no we're never all going to be happy so what are we looking for? You know, I just think the best thing we can look for is less pain. Okay, John, we'll talk about the new album. <laughs> Let's start with the single, whatever gets you through the night. That was the last thing I wrote, almost as I was in the studio, virtually walking in the studio. I heard somebody say on the radio, some uh, uh, like late night talk or one of those people on FMs and they say, well, you know, talking on the phone, saying, well, whatever gets you through the night. And then there it was, the whole tune came to me, you know. And uh, it started, in my head, it was going to be like Rock Your Baby. But I often have an idea of what it's going to be like, and it never turns out, as you can tell by listening to it, anything like it. It's a very loose track. I call it the crippled inside of the album, you know, or the Oyoko of the album, which are tracks from other albums I made, with, which people said, you should put it out as a single. And I always fought it and said, no, you know, it doesn't, I want to put this out, you know. But this time, I sort of swayed with the uh, the people that said put it out, and I think they were right, you know. And it, it's a pleasant experience doing the track. It's very loose. It's almost the first or second take. The musicians are raggy but swinging, you know. We tried to cut it a few times again. It never got that feel, you know. And I was fiddling about with it one night, and Elton John walked in with Tony King of Apple, who... Uh, you know, we're all good friends, and next minute Elton says, Hey, you know, can I put a bit of piano on that? I said, sure, I love it. So he zapped in, and, you know, I was amazed at his ability. I'd never, I'd never seen him. I knew him, but I'd never seen him play. Him. Fine musician, great piano player. I was really pleasantly surprised at the way he could get in on such a loose track and add to it and keep up with the rhythm changes, obviously, because it doesn't keep the same rhythm. It's subtle, but it doesn't. And then he sang with me, and we had a great time. And that's the story behind that. In the song, I'm Scared, you show the frightened side of John Lennon. But in Bless You, you reveal a deep kind of inner strength. Would you comment on that, please? In a way, it's about Yoko and I, you know? And in a way, it's about a lot of couples, or all of us that go through that, whatever it's called, love experience, you know? and the way love changes, which is one of the surprises of life that we all find out that it doesn't remain exactly the same all the time, although it's still love. It comes in mysterious forms, it's wonders to perform. And Bless You expresses one side of it. It's like all the songs, it, say Scared, for instance. I am scared a lot of the time, I think we all are, but I'm not always scared. And uh, I do have vindictive side as well, but when it gets to writing down how Yoko and I feel about each other, that's how I feel about her. And I know that's how she feels about me. And we're as close as you can get. That's why I don't talk about Yoko and I, not because I've got something to hide, because everything turns into a cliche. I think I sound like Sonny and Cheryl Liz or somebody, you know, one of those people. But 
we do feel very close. We are close. And it's, uh, it's a funny uh, example, but it's the same as the Beatles. She's one of my friends, like Paul, George, and Ringo, and we're going to be close and together the rest of our lives. How are George, Ringo, and Paul doing? Are they happy and productive now? Oh, well, you can tell by the, you know, overall by the charts how well they're doing. They're professionally, like anybody, they have their ups and downs. Uh, Ringo, I've spent more time with in the last two, two and a half years than any other ex beatles because he comes to this country a lot, you know? And uh, we get on fine, that's, you know, I don't have to say that. He's been here a lot for one reason or other, so I've seen a lot of him. The next one I've seen a lot of is Paul, because he travels more than George. George I've seen maybe twice in two years and talked on the phone a couple of times. And Ringo, Paul and I were together in LA, and Paul and I were together in New York a couple of nights, that was two months ago or something. We just drank wine and said, remember this, remember that, and we did all that trip. And we had a jam session together in the West Coast, too. It's the first time we'd be in the studio together. George, I, I'm expecting to see when he's on tour, I thought of going, I know he's going to rehearse on the West Coast. Oh, he'll kill me for saying this, but I thought of just zapping out to see him before the tour, but I don't think it'd be too much fun before he goes on tour. I mean, he's going to be wound up, and he's the first one of us out on the road. He's, he's carrying the whole ball game. But, but uh, it, I, I, we get on fine, you know. I mean, we all had our little uh, pains when we split up, and that was probably basically down to fear, you know, however much we wanted to be independent. It's quite hard to be independent after 10 years of being locked in each other's arms, as it were. You know, suddenly you're on, you're on your own, you know? And uh, <clears throat> it's quite, it was quite an experience for all of us, and quite frightening as it was for me, and no doubt I, I'm almost sure it was for the others. But I think we've got over that. I'm Jim Ladd. In concluding this show, there's a couple of things that I'd like to say. Number one. No matter what news stories you may have read, whether it be in the straight press or the rock and roll music publications, I found John Lennon to be one of the most pleasant and unpretentious people I have yet to interview. Now, as you've heard, he is a brilliant man with all the gifts and problems that accompany that genius. But an ego-tripping, uptight rock and roll star, he just is not. During the course of John Lennon's career, he has involved himself with many different social movements, spoken out on many issues, and raised thousands and thousands of dollars for charities and causes that he believes in, all for the betterment of this not-so-peaceful world. Now, it would have been easy for Lennon to just sit back with the money he's earned and do nothing, but he hasn't. He hasn't forgotten about people, and people are something John Lennon loves very much. For this reason, he is loved and respected by millions, not only for being a Beatle, but just for being John Lennon. There was a period where I thought I never would go on stage again and be paid for it. You know, and that was a very idealistic statement, probably. But it wasn't, I didn't make a statement. That's how I felt. Because you know? I thought, you know, I've been paid enough. <laughs> yeah, that's what I went through. Now, I'm not saying I'd never do it now, because you know, I change from day to day. I don't know whether it's liberal or whatever it is. And I don't like to be pinned down. I don't even like to know what I'm going to do next week. But that was partly how I felt about live performance. I thought I earned my money from the records. And if I perform, I'll perform for free. But as I, with everything, like we're saying, there's a catch-22. Unfortunately, charities and those things are used for the best, the worst managed shows on earth. And the artist is the one that gets slaughtered if anything goes wrong at all. And that really gave me the scares, too. So then I stopped performing. I just thought, forget it. You know, not only was the immigration hassling me, which stopped me performing for about a year, because I was just in and out of court. Then I thought, oh, you know, forget it. If I go out for money, you know, that's one thing. If I go out for charity, that's another thing. Either way, I, I, I don't. I was lo losing the fun of it, of it. As long as I can have fun, I don't care what it is, you know, what it's for or how it's for. If the if the vibes are going to be good, etc., etc. You know, it's always been a fantasy of mine, and I underline the word fantasy, to get the Beatles and Dylan and the Stones and the Who and 
anybody else that would come together and telecast a worldwide event and, and say in effect that, look, we put down all of our ego trips and all of our personal hassles and whatever to get this thing together to show that we really believe in a positive and collective good. Now, why don't you all get busy and let's make it happen. You know, I wondered if this had ever crossed John Lennon's mind. Yeah, yeah, well, I've been there many times. <clears throat> I think uh, Bangladesh was a culmination of thoughts like that. Because years ago, all of the Beatles, there was a feeling of that in the 60s, like when we did a broadcast, a live broadcast on Telstar, one of those satellites of all you need is love, the Stones were there, and everybody in London was there, and there was that feeling in the air, and there was a lot of possibilities then. And we often talked about, imagine if you got Elvis, and, you know, we include Elvis, of course, you know, and uh, all the people that we loved as teenagers, and everybody that was current, you know, the Dylans and the Stones and put together the biggest mother show on earth for all peace, all love, or whatever you call it. And it was always talked about, but nobody could ever quite get it together. And the nearest thing was George's Bangladesh. But for the Beatles, it was not the right time because we were not exactly you know, in each other's pockets at the time. We were still trying to unstick the glue of togetherness. You know? But uh, yeah, it is a, it's a wonderful fantasy, but I, I'd go along with the ride, but I do not have the strength to put it together. Yeah, you see, I, I'd definitely go with it. I'd help if somebody else, you know, it's got to be one of those people that can organize, you know, I'm not a great organizer. I can organize a group of musicians to perform and play. I can organize albums, I can organize things on a musical level, but it, even that difference between George and I is apparent, but never mind. Maybe the next one. Thank you for being with us tonight. I hope you've enjoyed this evening with John Lennon. Rick Hemmett was in charge of production, and I'd like to thank Bob Buziak from Capitol Records in Los Angeles, and Bob Edson from Capitol in New York for arranging this meeting. And a very special thanks to Damien, who helped immeasurably with the writing and the creating and the energy level for this very special program. I'm Jim Ladd. Thanks, John. Good night.